uh, Tom Hudson uh, from uh, Dallas. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, you will be discussing uh, uh, temporal aliveness and what is the best patient for an mTOR inhibitor, right? Certainly, and, and it's hard to, to match Bernard and his last slide there, but we'll try to do this. I have to be honest with you, when I got this invitation, I, I wasn't sure if I should believe this topic. Um, I thought it was a joke. Who is the ideal mTOR patient? Um, you've already heard from three um, speakers eloquently about VEGF inhibition. Certainly, those, the VEGF inhibitors seem to be the most generalizable drugs out there, so most patients we see are going to be candidates for that. But I think what you will see is that there are subgroups that are probably ideal for mTOR inhibition. Alluded to already by my colleagues, um, poor risk being the one that we're most common with. But you know what we're looking for in kidney cancer is really predictive factors for targeted therapy in and we really don't have any validated predictive factors yet. And I just remind us that we have a variety of different biomarkers that we're using um, in cancer management, but the ones that are most important for us um, that we have at least some preliminary data needs to be validated is prognostic and predictive um, biomarkers, and in some regards, some pharmacodynamic biomarkers. And I wanted to review the data that supports the role of mTOR inhibition as a viable cancer option for selected uh, patients with this disease. I think right now, clinically, um, many of you in the room would agree with me that the factors that aid in selecting agents between the classes, VEGF and mTOR, are shown here. You got VEGF inhibitors, we generally think for good performance status, uh, patients who need rapid responses and um, certain comorbidities, whereas the mTOR inhibitor class, sometimes under-recognized as an important class in this disease, has been left to poor risk disease patients, which in, really should represent 10 to 20 percent of our practice in the frontline setting patients that have had prior VEGF inhibitor, i.e. second line or refractory setting, non-clear cell histologies is often pointed to as a reason to use mTOR inhibitors. Um, so these three um, bullet points here are probably the, the main subgroups that we're going to explore as potential roles for mTOR inhibitors. So let's start with temsorolimus, which was the newest, or excuse me, the oldest of the mTOR inhibitors that really heralded the, the class as a viable cancer um, strategy. Um, if you remember back to Gary Hudy's New England Journal paper, this was a plenary presentation in, at, at ASCO, the same year Sutent was presented, um, was a trial that was done in predominantly poor-risk patients. In fact, it's the largest trial done in a poor-risk patient population, the only, of, only agent with uh, documented overall survival as a primary endpoint in a randomized phase three trial. And as you recall, the, the modifications um, that occurred in the poor-risk features to allow the trial to complete enrollment um, but these are generally the accept acceptable poor risk features. And there was a benefit in favor of single agent temsorolimus with a median survival of 10.9 months. You heard from my colleague, Dr. Hawkins, about pazopinib. He shared a trial where there was an overall survival in, with pazopinib in poor risk patients of approximately five months. So clearly this seems to be a group of patients that may benefit from mTOR inhibition. We've had some modern trials, uh, trials done within the past few years that have been read out. Um, using um, mTOR inhibitors. This is an intersect trial. You'll hear more about that coming up. Um, it was a negative trial, per se, for the primary endpoint. Um, and in this trial, similar to what had been reported by Jan Dutcher from the pivotal trial, there was a benefit seen um, in non-clear cell histology. In fact, it was the only benefit when looking at hazard ratio that did not cross midline. So one would say it's um, non-clear cell histologies, although not centrally path reviewed, but the idea of non-clear cell histologies being a subtype that may benefit from mTOR inhibition seems to be validated by the most recent modern trials. Um, Interact, which was a combination trial of TEM versus BEV. Bernard mentioned um, suggesting there was benefit with bevacizumab. I'll say um, the trial didn't really add anything into the knowledge base on is there a group of patients that respond to temsorolimus, but this was a trial um, that included temsorolimus in patients, remember, with good and intermediate risk, too. And so what we've outlined so far is that temsorolimus may be unique in patients with poor risk. So what is the basis for this activity? Is it just a clinical trial phenomenon, or do we have any basic science evidence that would back up its, its activity in poor risk? Well, I think, you know, data coming out of UCLA um, by Alan Pantuck, Bob Figlin, when he was there, suggested that, that phospho S6 was a strong predictor for survival and localized in localizing and metastatic disease. Um, high nuclear phospho AKT expression was associated with a favorable prognosis, whereas high cytoplasmic was associated with a poor prognosis. And multivariate analysis included um, at their institution showed that there were several poor prognostic factors, including activation of what we now recognize as being the P10, the mTOR pathway. 
So high expression of mTOR pathway components has been identified as patients, um, a subgroup of patients that may benefit from mTOR targeted therapy. And it, show, it, 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 it correlated with patients who were deemed to be poor prognosis. So patients who had other features of poor prognosis that we clinically recognize, hypercalcemia, poor performance status, were also those same group of patients that had high um, expression of mTOR pathway, um, as is shown in this slide. So you can see a difference in disease-specific survival when one looks at the mTOR pathway components that are overexpressed versus those that are not. And then um, more recent reports um, coming out of cancer in 2011 was looking at cancer-specific survival associated with activated mTOR pathway. So if you were phospho mTOR negative, you did better, you lived longer. If you were phospho mTOR positive, um, you did worse. And, and again, the thought is that the majority of these patients that are positive with mTOR are what would be considered the hang or moats or poor risk patients by clinical features. And so another way to look at this is, is predictors of response. Um, this is more of a basic science where they took 20 specimens, looked at expression of phospho S6 and, and phospho AKT, and this was able to correlate with what we thought from the previous studies with response to temsorolimus. So when there was overexpression of these mTOR pathway components in poor risk patients, they seemed to respond better to temsorolimus. Okay, so it seems based on the clinical science data that there is a rationale to use mTOR inhibition in poor risk patients that has been substantiated now by uh, several clinical trials of temsorolimus. And hence, it has an NCCN and ESMO EUA category one designation in that group of patients. Um, you know, there's other biomarkers that you can look at. You know, once people are started on mTOR inhibitors, there's been thoughts that maybe pneumonitis may be a, a marker of a patients that will go on to benefit from, from this. Other kind of uh, pharmacodynamic biomarkers that have been looked at, lipid elevation, hyperglycemia occurring, did not seem to pair out as being a predictor of ongoing response to it. Um, and then some of you may be familiar with LDH of looking at patients before starting, looking at those patients that have increased LDH. Again, a marker for a poor risk patient, if you had increased LDH, um, you were likely to have benefit from temsorolimus. So again, supporting the activity of, the disease, uh, of temsorolimus in poor risk patients. So hopefully um, I've established there that it appears in frontline setting, poor risk patients, that there's a unique role in patients for mTOR. But what I can't say universally is that that's going to be for all poor risk patients. You've seen that there is some activity of the VEGF inhibitors in this same group. But again, the bulk of the data supports temsorolimus as a standard of care in that setting. If we move into the refractory patient, we're, we're in our, my other favorite drug, Everolimus. And if you believe that there is a difference between the two mTOR inhibitors, this is why. Um, you know, here is the AUC curve of IV injection, where you reach a peak, and then you could quickly um, decrease down to a trough level, versus continuous oral daily dosing where you're maintaining an AUC at a higher level. And so, you know, we've, I know many of us have been asking for data to really support that there is a difference. Um, if there is, it would be this, that maybe having a higher AUC is associated with greater effects on the phospho S6 kinase. Um, and so that has, again, as far as I'm aware, never been validated as to be true. But um, there is some theory, though, that there's a difference between the agents. And in the, in the trial that was the pivotal trial that resulted in approval of Everolimus as an agent in the refractory setting is, is the trial by Bob Mozer shown here. You're familiar with this. And we saw an advantage to Everolimus with the PFS updated of over five months versus placebo, which was under two months and it established it as a standard option in the refractory patient population. But now that we've gone through and we have other agents to give in the second line setting and beyond, we've scrutinized the data from record one and we realized that really the role of mTOR um, is actually in the second line and beyond when the majority of patients in this record one trial were actually in the third line or beyond. So it appears that there is um, a role for mTOR inhibitors that isn't deemed absolutely second line but is in a refractory patient population, so second, third, fourth, fifth line, there appears to be a role for mTOR inhibitor in that setting. In fact, most people would consider using an mTOR inhibitor as a standard therapy in patients at some point in the second, third, or fourth line. Again, if we look at is there any benefit, it seems like from this particular trial compared to placebo, all subgroups benefited from Everolimus, so it appears that it's a generalizable drug. There have been new modern trials looking at Everolimus. Unfortunately, they have been negative trials. I think there's a, a session looking at negative trials and why they're negative. And Tim gets to, I think, champion that um, here in the next session. But um, again, um, evidence that bevacizumab may have some activity, but certainly the combination did not appear to be better than interferon um, combination. And then the record three crossover, as you know, um, 
didn't really meet its primary endpoint either, either. So it appears that just as a generalizable drug, using an mTOR inhibitor in all comers in the frontline setting is probably not optimal. We've heard that we have VEGF inhibitors that are probably more optimal in that setting, and mTOR inhibitors in the frontline setting are probably most suited for the poor risk patient or the refractory patient. So just to end, there have been some um, attempts to further understand this, um, looking at pharmacogenomics, et cetera, and this is from the Memorial Group by, by Martin Voss. He looked at patients with advanced um, RCC who were determined to have long-term or short-term responses to mTOR inhibitors, so they're kind of the ends of the spectrum, and tried to analyze, analyze their cancer-related genes to see if he could find um, certain predictors there, looking for mutations, either gain of function or loss of function. And what he was able to show is there was a variety of different mTOR missense mutations or TSC1 mutations that may have um, put um, some patients at benefit for mTOR inhibitors. And it looked like that there were some genomic determinants of long-term response to everolimus, for instance, um, in this setting. So that brings us some hope that maybe with further study, we will be able to do some type of genetic testing on tumors that would allow us to at least identify a group of patients that may benefit uh, for mTOR inhibitors. So in conclusion, we, we certainly are in search of biomarker development. It's challenging when you've heard three VEGF inhibitors because we know most of our kidney cancer patients at, at presentation are HIF dependent. Um, so it's, it's hard to do biomarkers when a drug works in 80% of patients to identify that group. But certainly in a situation of poor risk patients or patients that have mTOR activated pathway components, you could imagine that would be a group of patients that may be very easy to, to do biomarker development in. So I, I, I encourage pharmaceutical companies in and independent um, um, people to continue to support this research. Um, we need validation of, of, of what I've just told you for mTOR inhibitors, and um, I think the future is gonna be in biomarkers and selecting and individualizing treatment. So to conclude, I think mTOR inhibitors do have a role. They'll be in kidney cancer for the years to come. I think the established role as based upon evidence is mTOR inhibitors as a frontline option in those minority of patients that have poor risk features and then mTOR inhibitors as a refractory option sometime along the lines of second, third, or fourth line um, in those patients. Thank you. Thank you very much.